Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, yes, I'm here in front of the whiteboard again today. Uh, last couple of uh, Sundays, I've been outside. It's just, it's too beautiful a summer to not get outside and, and do a little preaching and teaching outside. It's getting a little warm, but uh, it's just, it's beautiful. And so I've enjoyed the last couple of Sundays being outside, but a lot of people said, Brother Breaker, we missed the whiteboard. We want you to get back into the indoors, and uh preach with the whiteboard we want to learn some more so I was going to do a sermon today on on Israel and I'll probably do that next week but uh, this is a sermon that I had written down several months ago and wanted to do and uh, I like to be several months ahead so that I can go do things uh, I've been invited to go preach in several other places soon and it's good to get ahead in my messages so that I can wherever I might be I can just post it for that week's sermon but you get behind sometimes. Uh, I went to Mexico recently, and then I got back, and I had family visiting, so I'm behind, <laughs> a little bit behind. So um, the last couple of weeks, it's been, well, I'm just trying to keep up and get a sermon ready for Sunday. And I was praying about what to preach on, and I think I'm going to talk about very soon the nation of Israel. I think it's important that we look at Israel and how God is, is working with them and what the Bible says about Israel. But today I decided, after much prayer, and I had this written down, that I think the Lord would have me to speak on this subject. So I'm going to do more of a preaching today than a teaching, but the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, it'll be more teaching. We're going to look at today this question. The question is, are you balanced? Are you balanced? Are you a balanced person? Do you know what it is to be balanced? Have you ever seen what are called balances? I'm sure you probably have, but uh, you see a thing like this, and uh, what what it is is it, it hangs down on either side, and they're what's called balances. And so what you do is you would weigh something. This is the old way that they do balances. Now they have a digital scale, <laughs> but in the old days you would get a balance like this, and you would uh, weigh things. And you would find out which was heavier because it would do this or it would do that. And so today, I want to ask you this question. Are you balanced? We're going to look at some balances today. We're going to put you in the balances today. And we're going to find out if you're a balanced person. We're living in the last days. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times shall come. I believe we're there. We're in some perilous, perilous times today. And... It's so sad because there are very few people in the world today that are balanced. There are a lot of imbalanced persons persons in the world today, a lot of people that aren't balanced. They don't have a balanced life. Uh, some of it is because they're taught in schools how to become, uh, the term we use today is snowflakes, and they're not taught how to deal with life. They're taught, just go suck your thumb in a corner when things don't go your way, and that makes someone unbalanced, and that's not good. Uh, the reason that there's so many imbalanced people in the world today is because of drugs. Unfortunately, there are people that get hooked on drugs, then they become something that they normally wouldn't be. Um, they become drug addicts, and when you become addicted to something, well, then you turn into a completely different person. But I'm not talking about drugs like cocaine and things like that. I'm talking about over-the-counter drugs. Oftentimes, people will get on chemicals, and they'll take these chemical drugs, and it gives them a chemical imbalance. So there's a lot of people today that are not balanced. And what we need to be as a Christian and an individual is balanced. We need to have a balance in our lives. And I look at Christianity today and I, and I see that Christianity today is very, very unbalanced. <laughs> Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 11. And uh, let's see, I'll put this up here on this side. Proverbs chapter 11. I want to show you today the balance according to the Bible and how we who are Christians we should be balanced and the problem is many in the world today do not have this balance and because of that Christianity suffers uh, society suffers people suffer so we all need to have this proper balance in our lives and Christianity is supposed to be a balanced religion you need to have that balance within Christianity. If you go to an extreme, the balance falls. 
Imagine, picture somebody, you know, standing up on, on the top of this. Maybe somebody standing over here or somebody standing over here. Whenever there's not a proper balance, what happens? It turns and a person falls. So what I want to try to do today is talk about how to have a proper balance and how to keep from falling. I don't want to see people fall. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11 begins like this. Proverbs 11 says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. God says He hates a false balance. If someone is not balanced, then God says that's an abomination unto me. There are some things that need to be balanced. To go to one extreme or one another extreme, God says that's an abomination to me. I want things to be right. I want them to be equal. I want them to be the way they should be. I don't like to see extremes. So God wants a balance, and we are to be balanced. Let's look at the context of this. Verses 2 through 6, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Pride is something that if you get in your life, you will become unbalanced. And so we need to do everything we can to keep from being prideful according to the Word of God. Verse 3, the integrity of the, uprighteous, or of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. If a person begins to go down the way of perverseness and speaks perverse things and does perverse things, then they will begin to go and have an unperfect balance, and then they will be what? Destroyed. Verse 4, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. And that's what I want to do as a Christian, as a minister of the gospel. I want to keep you from falling. I want you as a Christian to keep from falling. And the best way to keep from falling is to not go out on a limb to an extreme. Stay where the Bible says you're supposed to stay. Don't go off on this end or that end. Stay in the middle. It's easier to balance in the middle. But when you get off on one end or another, you get in an extreme position, well, then you're going to fall one way or the other. We as Christians, we shouldn't fall. Uh, Proverbs 11.6 says, The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to remember there's a balance in our lives. Let's go to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 28. What is the Christian life like? The Christian life is like this. And I think this is a good verse to explain it. The Christian life is like a tightrope. Have you ever seen a tightrope act where a guy puts a rope a couple hundred feet and he walks on that rope and he walks across? What is he doing? He's balancing. He's trying to keep from falling one way or the other. So he's keeping his eye on that, on that rope. And he's balancing, he's walking across. That's why we read in Isaiah 28.10. Isaiah 28.10 says, For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It almost repeats itself again in verse 13. Look what it says here. The word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So the Bible says in verse 13 that the Word of God is like a line. So the Bible, the Word of God, is like a line. Yeah, sounds like a seagull every time I do that. that. But here's the Word of God. I'm going to abbreviate W-O-G, the Word of God. And you got a guy, and, and excuse this, but I'm not the best artist, but here's a guy, you know, here's his shoulders, here's his arms, and he's walking on this tightrope, and usually they hold a stick. So as you're looking down on a guy walking on a tightrope, you find it's quite interesting he has to hold that stick for balance. <laughs> what does that look like? It looks like a cross. <laughs> Always keep your eyes on the cross and what Jesus did for you. But the Bible says the Word of God is like a line. Line upon line, precept upon precept. He keeps his eyes on the Word, on the line, he won't fall. But if that tightrope walker looks a little bit over here to the right, what's he going to do? He gets his eyes off the line, he's going to fall off on that side. 
If he gets his eyes off the line, kind of looking over to the other side, what's he going to do? He's going to fall off on that side. So what we need to remember, what we need to do as Christians is realize our Christian life is to be on that line, on the Word of God. It's like a tightrope act. We're walking in our daily life on the line. The line is the Word of God. If we get our eyes out of the Word of God and look over there, well, we're going to fall into that, whatever that is over there. If we get our eyes off of the Word of God and we start looking over there, well, we're going to fall over there into whatever that is over there. And all too often people do that. They will follow something else rather than the Bible. And that's the way they begin to go. And they begin to fall instead of staying where they should be in the Word of God. People fall. Go back to Proverbs 11, 14. All too often within Christianity today, there are people that are Christians that fall into sin. And it's whichever way they're looking, that's the way they fall. Either to the right or to the left. But if you keep your eyes in that book and you keep reading the scriptures, the word of God, you won't fall. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Look what it says here. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Okay, so if you don't have someone there that cares about you to give you counsel, then you're going to fall. What is our counsel? What do we get the truth from? The word of God. So line upon line. Precept upon precept. On the scripture, we stand. We walk upon the word of God. We keep our eyes in the book so we don't fall one side or the other. 1 Corinthians 10.12, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. That's a warning from the Apostle Paul that we should always remember in the back of our mind, keep our feet firm in the word of God. We're like that tightrope walker. Don't look one way or the other. Take heed. Always remember, eyes upon the line so we don't fall into one side or another. In 1 Timothy 3.6, the Apostle Paul says about a pastor, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. The devil wants you to fall. It is so easy when you're walking on a tightrope to fall. It takes years and years of practice, usually, to be able to do that because our balance just isn't what it should be. But the more you practice, the less chance you have of falling. And the more you keep your eye on the line, the less chance. So as a Christian, Christians are supposed to mature. Christians are supposed to grow. We're supposed to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The more we read that word, the easier it is to stand on the line and not fall. I've got a little boy who just turned one years old. A little boy is walking now. <laughs> it's kind of a little bit of a sacrifice for me because he had only taken a couple of steps but he wasn't walking completely and then I went to Mexico for a week a couple weeks ago when I come back man he, he in that one week that I was gone to Mexico he learned to walk and he was running. He was literally running around the house. So I had to miss uh, seeing my young boy learn how to walk. All because I wanted to serve the Lord and do something for Him, you know. Well, it's a wonderful sacrifice because it was done for Him, so I understand and, and I'm happy about that. But the things we sacrifice for Jesus, amen. But He walks, and it's fun to watch my little boy how he's just learning his balance. So when he walks, he doesn't walk like me in a straight line to go where I'm going. He walks like this. <laughs> What's the problem? He's still learning. So he doesn't have that perfect balance yet. So he's, he's walking and then all of a sudden he stumbles and he catches himself. And then there's other times he just bump, falls right down. So maturity. It, it takes sometimes time to learn to have a balance. And so as Christians, when we get saved, we aren't automatically perfect, wonderful people. We have to grow. <laughs> And the way that comes is by reading the Bible. And the more we read the Word of God, the more we get that balance as a Christian. The more we get into the Word and, get, and hide the Word in our heart, the less chance we have of falling one way or another. So if I see someone who's a Christian and they're, they're having problems and they're in the world or they're not uh, like they should be, I ask them, hey brother, you've been, you've been reading the Word? Somebody has gotten their eyes off the line. That's why they've fallen into either false doctrine or in the sin or something. So we need to get back to the Word of God. 
Now, what I want to do today, I want to just give you five different things that I, I thought as I'm looking at Christianity today. In what's called Christianity today, I see a false balance. And the Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. God does not want a false balance. So what we need to do, we should be balanced. And we should have a balance in these things. So we should have a balance. Or we should be balanced in these things. I'm going to give you five things that we should be balanced in. And if Christianity would get balanced and not be messed up on these things, what a blessing and how God could change the world. But a lot of times Christianity, denominations, different, uh, different churches, different people, different pastors, they won't stay in the line and they begin to fall. And within Christianity today, we have what's called apostasy. And I'm sure you know that. Uh, but, you know, here's our timeline. Here's Jesus on the cross. Here's the church age. Here's the rapture. Boy, I can't wait for the rapture. The sooner the better. But we're right here. We're very close to the rapture in this time called apostasy. Apostasy means falling away. So some have already fallen away into false doctrine or into the world. That's why when I say the church today or, or Christianity, not everybody that claims to be a Christian is. There are many denominations that are full of lost people who claim to know the name of Christ, but they're not even born again because they've never trusted the gospel of salvation. So when I say Christianity, sometimes I use the term loosely, I'm talking about people that claim to be Christians, that claim to follow Christ, but I'm not talking to people that are all saved. Many of them are lost because they're not coming through the gospel to be saved. There are many people within Christianity that aren't saved, and yet they claim to be Christians. So I want you to get a hold of that. I want you to understand that today I'm going to deal with Christianity, but I'm also going to deal with you as an individual. And I want to ask you this question. Are you balanced? in what you believe, what you practice, what you preach, and what you teach, and how you walk as a Christian. And if you claim to be a Christian, but you're part of a false denomination, or you're part of an apostate church, I want to ask you, why don't you come to the truth? Why don't you come back to the line? Because that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to keep taking you back to this. This line right here is the King James Bible, not another version. There is no other Bible than the King James. Other versions are perversions. If you don't know that, know that, you need to do a little bit of studying on Bible versions because other versions come from different fountains and they've been messed with and perverted. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. But I want to say this. Do you have a balance? Are you balanced? Let me, let me rephrase this. Are you balanced would be a better way. Are you, make it personal, balanced when it comes to salvation? Or do you take an extreme view See, what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to show you the right thing to believe, and then I'm going to show you the extreme view on each one of these. And what I'll do is I'll show you how going to an extreme makes a false balance. And by having a false balance, well, God says that's an abomination unto Him. According to the Bible, salvation is by faith. The Bible says we're to believe, and by faith, by believing, we're saved. Now, a lot of people today, rather than going to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, which is the gospel, rather than going to the blood of Jesus Christ and showing you how salvation is by belief, salvation is by faith, faith in what? Well, according to the Bible, salvation is by faith in the blood. So Romans 3, 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's like a substitute, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the mission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So, our faith is to be in the blood of Christ to be saved. That's salvation. But there are people today that preach a false gospel, a false plan of salvation. A lot of people today, rather than going to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 5, you know, all these different great passages on how to be saved by faith, believing, they'll only go to Romans chapter 10. And oftentimes they'll only go to one verse in Romans chapter 10, and they will take you to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, and they'll say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they like to take that verse 
and go to extreme with it. And when they do, they have a false balance. So what they do is they go to you and they'll say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they say, now that's what the Bible says, so all you have to do is with your mouth just say, Oh Jesus, please save me. Now you know what you've just done? you said something with your mouth. If you would read all of Romans, you would see there's another verse that says, You believe with your heart unto righteousness. So when you believe with the heart is when you're saved. Not when you say it with your mouth. Now, you can believe from the heart the same moment you say it from the mouth, and that would be great. The problem is, many people go to an extreme and tell you, if you will just call with the mouth, they say calling is mouth only, then they say, guess what? You're saved because you said Jesus with your mouth. Alright, so I guess every carpenter who's lost, who's ever been up on a roof hammering nails and hit his finger with a, with a hammer and said, Oh, Jesus, I guess he just got saved. What a blessing. I mean, I guess every carpenter that ever lived is a Christian because they called upon the name of the Lord when they hit their finger with a hammer and said, Oh, Jesus, because... But no, they meant it as a cuss word. You see, it's not what you say with your mouth that saves you. It's whether or not you believe from the heart. So we have people today that uh, go to one extreme. The other extreme they go to is they is people say, well, if you'll just believe in your head. Well, what's the right balance? What's the correct balance according to the Bible? What is the correct teaching of salvation that's not an extreme view? What is the right way to get saved? What is the right way to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked. The right way to call upon the name of the Lord, according to the scriptures, is from the heart. So the correct way, and we're going to show this here, is faith from the heart. That's the balanced approach. We're going to the scriptures and we're saying, now, God, I don't want to be a false balance because that's an abomination, so how do I get saved? The Bible says when you believe from the heart. Uh, Acts, you know, eight thirty-seven. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Um, you know, uh, Romans chapter ten talks about uh, you believe with the heart, believing unto righteousness. But there are people that go to one extreme and say, "Well, you believe it, but just believe it in your head. It it's not important if you believe it in your heart." Well, that's an extreme view. That's your Calvinist. You know, that's the intellectual argument. Oh, salvation is by what I believe in my head. The other extreme view is, oh, you just call with your mouth. So if you just call and say, oh, God, save me, you're saved because you said it with your mouth. No, you've gone to an extreme. Whether you call from the mouth depends upon whether or not you believe from your heart. Unless you believe in the gospel from the heart, then this is meaningless. Now, there are people that have called on God and said, oh, God, I accept you and I trust you as my Savior. Amen. And when they said that from their mouth... They believed in the gospel at the very same moment, and they were saved because they believed from the heart. But it's not the mouth that saves you or what you say with your mouth. You see, these people, they, they go to an extreme. And God says, that's an abomination. Why are you taking an extreme view? Why aren't you balanced? Why aren't you preaching the gospel correctly? It's really sad to see people go to an extreme and try to argue they're extreme. Well, that will make people fall. There's some people on YouTube that are preaching a false gospel. And they're telling people, oh, it's just the one, two, three, repeat after me. Or they're telling people, if you'll just say these words or repeat the sinner's prayer or with your mouth say this, that, or the other thing, then you're saved. What have they done? They've taken an extreme position. And they've taken the word call and they defined it as with the mouth only. They don't go to 2 Timothy 2.22 that say they call upon the Lord of a pure heart. You see, in the Bible, the calling has to come from the heart, not just the mouth. If all you've done is called on God with the mouth and asked God to save you, but you've never believed from the heart, you are lost. And you need to get saved. Because the true gospel, the true doctrine of salvation, is the one that is faith from the heart. Believing in the gospel from your heart. There are people that accuse Robert Breaker and they say, well, he's just an easy believism person. He just tells somebody if you'll just believe it. And they think believing is with the head. No! You know how many verses are in the Bible that talk about believing from your heart? So you can't go to an extreme. I don't go to that extreme and say, just believe it in your head. Never have taught that. Never will. 
I don't go to that extreme and say, well, if you'll just repeat this prayer after me, or if you'll just ask God to save you from your mouth, then you'll be saved. No. I take time to explain the gospel to people. I take them to 1 Corinthians 15. I take them to Romans 3. I take them to the scriptures. And I show them, now God says you have to believe with all of your heart to be saved. You can, with your mouth, go to the Lord in prayer and tell Him, Lord, I do accept you. I do trust you. But the prayer isn't what saves you. The words you say from your mouth are not what saves you. God is looking at the heart. Romans chapter 10 says, The righteousness which is of faith speaketh in this wise. Say not in your heart. Your faith speaks to God when your faith in the heart is from the heart in what God said to believe in. And that's what God's looking for. So it's so sad to see people get, get into this thing to where they want to argue. <laughs> and what they're doing without even realizing it is they're taking their eyes off the scripture Line upon line, precept upon precept. They're getting out of balance. They're taking an extreme position. And guess what? It's making them fall headlong the wrong way. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten over the last three or four years from people that say, Brother Breaker, there's this person on YouTube, and I used to watch him, and I used to believe in him, and he's a King James Bible believer, but he had me believing that salvation was just by my mouth and what I say with my mouth. And they say, every night I would get down by my bed and I'd say, oh God, please save me! Because they didn't know if they were saved or not. And they'd go back to watch that person and he kept saying, no, you call upon the Lord with the mouth, so you just ask God to save you. And they'd do that every night, over and over. And they weren't saved. So many of those people said, Brother Breaker, when I started watching you, and I saw the gospel for the first time, and I understood what Jesus did as he died in my place. I believe from the heart, and that's when I got saved. They said, I didn't get saved watching that guy. I got saved from hearing the word of God. And I just say, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I hope that guy understands that, <laughs> because he's still preaching an extreme position, an unbalanced presentation of the gospel, because he's not telling people to believe from the heart. He's telling them only from the mouth, just say, oh, God, save me. And then he's expecting them to be saved because something they said from their mouth. And then he's blaming people like me, saying, all you're doing, Mr. Breaker, is telling people just to believe in your head. And it's like, has he ever seen any of my preaching? <laughs> Probably not. Because if he did, I tell people that salvation is what the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept. And the Bible says when your faith from the heart is in the blood atonement of Christ, that's when you're saved. Because that's what the Bible teaches. You believe. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this right. Faith is what saves us. Faith from the heart. So that's number one. Number two, sanctification. You see, the last thing that I ever want to do as a Christian is fall into sin and fall into heresy. I want to have the right approach. I want to be balanced. And the only way I can find to do that is to go right to the book. Stick with what the Bible says. Not my opinion. Not go to an extreme and take an extreme position, but to stay where the Bible is and stay balanced. Otherwise, I will fall, and I don't want to do that. And I've seen so many men who claim to be Christians that have already done that. Many of them have fallen off into an extreme position. And God says, that's an abomination to me. Because you've taken a position that's not a balanced approach. And you've gone to an extreme with it. And now you're falling. And you're falling into sin. Falling into false doctrine. Falling into heresy. Another thing I want to say, let's go to Acts chapter 26. Um, how about having a balance when it comes to sanctification? Acts chapter 26 and verse 18. Look at what the Bible says. Acts 26, 18. The Apostle Paul is telling us that Jesus told him this. And Jesus told him to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Okay, so according to the Bible, when you're saved, you're sanctified. All right, what does it mean to be sanctified? Sanctified means cleansed. So when you're saved, you're sanctified. That's your soul is cleaned or washed. All your sins are washed away. How? in the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 5 says unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So it's the blood of Jesus 
that washes our sins away. And when we're saved, we're sanctified. Now, there's another sanctification, and that's of your, of your body. And as a Christian, why? what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to try our best to keep our bodies clean. And the only way to do that, as the Bible says in, in uh, John 17, is sanctify them through thy word, thy word is true. So we, we try to keep a, a, our bodies clean by daily reading the Bible and trying to keep and live a good, godly lifestyle and living a good Christian life. But when we're saved, we're sanctified. Well, there are some people that say, no, I don't believe that. No, no, no. They say the way you get sanctified, according to them, is water baptism. <laughs> and so they come along. I still get people to this day that email me and say, Brother Breaker, it's Acts 2.38. It's Acts 2.38. It's the water baptism that saves. And so they try to tell you that you're saved by water. Well, that would be what you do. If we're saved by water baptism, then we do something to be sanctified. The water washes our sins away. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's someone that's gone to the book of Acts, and they've only gone to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and they said, I like that, I'm going to stop right there. They don't go to Acts 16, uh, verse 30 and 31. It says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So what are they doing? They're unbalanced in their Bible reading, in their doctrine. And they think that water baptism saves you. So they think that you do works to get saved. The Bible teaching is we're sanctified. Our soul is washed from the blood of Jesus when we believe by faith. But then there's other people that come along. And these people, what do they do? Well, they try to take you to the law. And they try to say you've got to keep the law in order to be saved. And this is called legalism. And so what do they do? Well, they try to say, well, you know, you got to go to the law. you got to get back under the law. Well, the whole book of Galatians is all about that, how we're not back under the law. So you see people going around saying, you know, well, it, to be sanctified, to be cleansed, to be, have your sins washed away, you have to be baptized in water. Or you have to keep the law to be saved. Those are two extreme points of view. The Bible says that we are sanctified by the blood of Christ. We are cleansed. I don't have time to go to Hebrews. We just finished not too long ago our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through Hebrews. And how Hebrews says that Jesus Christ sanctified us once for all through his one sacrifice of shedding his blood on the cross. So our soul is sanctified. We are forgiven of all sins when we get saved. How? By faith. We don't keep the law. We don't get water baptized thinking that that's going to save us. After we're saved, we, we live right and do right. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. So read that verse and look at that. Now there's some other people that go to an extreme that's crazy. You've got your universalist. Um, I don't even have time to put them up here, but the universalist and your Unitarians. The Unitarian Universalists, they teach the brotherhood of man. You go to a universalist church. We've got one here in Pensacola. What do Universalist Unitarians believe? Well, they believe, and I don't know how they believe this, but all people in the world are all the children of God. That means they're all saved. God will never put them in hell. They're all going to heaven when they die. So they're all sanctified. So it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to heaven. That's an extreme view. That's not a Bible view. So we need to stay where the Bible says, not go to one extreme or another. Unfortunately, some people do. Another thing we need to do, we need to make sure we have God's Word. We need to make sure the line that we're looking at is the true Word of God. Unfortunately, there's people out there that have different versions of the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 2.17, look at this. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as some of sincerity... But as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.2 also says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. There were some people who have corrupted the word of God. They handle the word of God deceitfully. They take the Bible and they, and they mess it up. There's people out there that try to tell you that the true word of God is the critical text. And they say, oh, you need the critical text because they're the true word of God. 
Yeah, well, how come there's so many verses missing? You know what? The most famous probably today Bible is the is the NIV. That stands for the non-inspired version. I, I'm sorry. Uh, what was that? Oh, the the nutty idiots version. No, no, that's not right. The NIV. Um, uh, uh, the, oh, the the new international version. If you go and you get an NIV, you look through that. There's verses missing everywhere. You cannot find Acts eight thirty seven. Uh, you go to Mark chapter 9, there's some verses missing. Uh, you go to the end of the book of Mark, there's a lot of verses missing. Who put out the NIV? Well, there were two homosexuals that said they worked on that. And the NIV is not God's Word. It comes from critical, corrupt text. So I'm going to put down here, corrupt, because that's what the NIV is. It's corrupt. So unless you have a King James Bible, you don't even have a Bible. You're standing on a rope... If you're using the NIV, but that rope's about to break. <laughs> because that's a corrupt text. Now, I don't have time to get into why the NIV is not God's Word. Maybe someday I'll do a video on that. But there are doctrinal errors all over the NIV. And verses missing. And it comes from the wrong line of text. So what, we should, what should we do? We should believe the KJV only. We should believe the King James only. KJV only. Why? Because that's God's Word. Now, I've got a YouTube video, and you can type in on YouTube, Robert Breaker, King James Bible, and you'll see I was invited to a uh, church to speak on that. It's a couple hours long. And I'll show you, beyond any shadow of a doubt, why the King James Bible is God's Word. I'll give you the truth about all the new versions. All the new versions come from different texts, texts that have been messed with by the Catholic Church critical texts that have been messed with where people who don't believe the Bible have deceitfully come to it and said, I don't like that reading, so I'm just going to take that out. And I don't like that word, so I'm going to take it out. And I don't think these verses should be there, so I'm going to take it out. And they've taken away from the Word of God. The true Word of God is the King James Bible because it comes from the true line of text, from where the Bible says they should come from. Now, there are other people out there who will go to another extreme. And they go to the extreme, oh, well, I don't believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. And so they say, for me, it's the Greek and it's the Hebrew. And so they go, I don't use the King James, I go back to the original Greek, and I go back to the original Hebrew, and, and I just don't, I go back to the original autographs, they say. Those people are liars. Because there's no such thing as any original autographs today. The original autographs would be the actual paper that Peter and John and, and uh, um, James and, and all these people would have written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those would be the original ones that they penned with their own finger. And you ask them, where's the Word of God? They said the original autographs. And you scratch your head and go, well, where are they? They go, well, yeah, well, because there are no original autographs. Those original autographs that they penned, there were copies made of that. And then other copies, and then other copies, and other copies. And those eventually, because they're paper, about 2,000 years ago, dissolved. Paper doesn't last a long time. So we don't have any original autographs today. All we have today are copies of 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 copies. Of copies. And people say, well, there were errors and mistakes in the copies. But yeah, but we have the Greek Texas Receptus that matches over 90-something percent these 5,000 different texts. And we can take those and we can get back to what the original said if we do the process of collation. Now, I don't have time to get into that. So the King James Bible comes from the Greek Texas Receptus. All new versions of the Bible, other than the King James, come from two texts, the Vat and the Sin. <laughs> Not a good thing. The Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. Those are two Roman Catholic corrupt texts that don't even agree with one another. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus don't even agree, and there's 3,000 differences between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those first four books, and these two texts. Yet they want to take those texts and say, that's where the true Word of God came from, the one that's full of errors and mistakes. When you go over here and you start looking at the King James Bible, you find there's over 5,000, uh, well, 
pretty much 5,300 Greek manuscripts, and they agree with each other over 95% of the time. Where are you going to go for a Bible? Two corrupt texts that have 3,000 changes in just the first four books? Or are you going to go over here to 5,000 uh, witnesses and say, let's, let's look to those for the Bible? Especially when they came from the right place. So there's a lot of people today that don't have the Word of God. And so what do they do? Well, they, they want a Bible that's not God's Word, one that has a lot of things taken out. Other people say, well, I don't believe the English. I don't believe a translation can be inspired. So I don't believe in the King James. Why well, go to the Greek and the Hebrew? Yeah, which Greek and Hebrew? You see, these corrupt texts come from the, the Septuagint, which is corrupt, from the Greek New Testament, also known as the Nestle Allent, which is corrupt, and from the Kittle Old Testament, which is very corrupt. So there are corrupt Greek and Hebrew. The right Greek would be the Texas Receptus text, but there's five different ones of those. And they agree with each other, mostly, I think there's about a hundred different places where they disagree. And people say, well then how can we know that the King James is the Word of God? Ah, good question. You see, these texts right here, Vaticanus and Sidiaticus, they're 400 to 600 years after Jesus. The Texas Receptus comes from copies of copies of copies of copies of copies that go all the way back to 100 years after Jesus. You say, yeah, but they're, not, they're only 95% in agreement. Yeah, but you know what? 100 years after Jesus, the early church was in Antioch of Syria, and you have the Syriac text, which is about 100 years after Jesus. King James Bible... They use the Syriac text. They use the older manuscripts, 100 years after Jesus. And so whenever the Greek Texas Receptus said something that they didn't know if that was right or not, they went to the Syriac and they said, well, there it is, 100 years after Jesus, so that must be right. So God's used the King James Bible and given us exactly what the original autographs would have said. And you'll get more light from a King James Bible than you would ever get going to any Greek or Hebrew or any new version of the Bible. You're going to go off into an extreme and become a liberal if you're not careful. Or you're going to go off on an extreme and become a legalist unless you stick with the Bible. You see, the liberals use these modern versions. And the legalists try to go to the Greek and Hebrew and say, we're going to correct the King James Bible. No, you're not. You need to stick with the true Word of God. God used the King James Bible. Well, Let's go to another one. Let's go to study. I mean, I'm having a good time. I hope you are. <laughs> There's some people out there that hate the King James Bible. You know what they are? They're ignorant. I don't want to call them names. I don't want to put them down, but the word ignorant isn't a name call. Ignorant means they're just unlearned. They just don't know. So I'm not calling them a name. I'm describing what they are. They haven't learned yet. So what do they need to do? They need to study why the King James Bible is God's Word. And if you study it, you'll find out that it is. It's the only one that can be. Because it's the only one that comes from the right text, that goes to the older text, the Syriac, as well as the Greek and Hebrew. And it's the only one that God's given more revival throughout the world than any other book in the history of mankind. Study the King James Bible. Check out my video on what it says there. Um, YouTube, Robert Breaker. Type in Robert Breaker, King James Bible, and it should come up. And you'll see, beyond any shadow of doubt, that the King James is God's Word. To not believe that is to go off onto an extreme and get a false balance. Most of your modern uh, churches today that use anything other than the King James are now teaching heresy. And it's because they found that heresy in the NIV and the other versions of the Bible. Because these all come from Gnostic texts. And the Gnostics did not believe in the deity of Christ. That's why modern versions attack the deity of Christ. So many things I could get, go into, but not time. Study. Study. What does the Bible say? 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What are we to do today? We're to rightly divide. What do people do today? They don't rightly divide. Rather than follow what the KJV says, what the Bible says, they will go by what their denomination says. So they teach what their denomination says. They've gone off to an extreme. They're following men, not God. 
Other people will go to the other extreme and they say, well, you know, the Bible says this, but we believe in philosophy. Or we believe in, you know, what the world says. And so we're going we're gonna to teach, you know, the Bible where we want to, but we're going to also teach the doctrines of the world. And, and we're going to, you know, we're going to propagate philosophy. They go to an extreme. They're not studying the Word of God. Rather than line upon line, precept upon precept, only going by what the Bible says, they look over here and they say, oh, well, philosophy, and they fall into philosophy. Or they look over here and they say, oh, look at that. This man teaches. Why, this guy wrote this book that says this. Why, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow this religion because they teach. And they've got their eyes off the line, and they've fallen into false doctrine. There are so many different denominations within Christianity today, and it's a shame. Colossians 2.8 warns us about philosophy and to stay away from it. Um, Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30, the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, there are going to be men that arise and that are going to come around and they're going to draw people after themselves and make converts and they're going to make their own disciples. Many today, rather than following the Bible only, they'll begin to follow men. And there are so many different denominations in the world because men would come up and men would say, well, I know the Bible says this, but I teach this. Follow me. Well, if we want to have the right balance, we need to stick with what the Bible says. Don't be followers of men, unless those men are followers of the Bible. But there's a lot of men that depart from the Bible and they say, follow me, and they get people out of the Scriptures and into false doctrine. I don't want to be a follower of what a man says. I want to be a follower of what the Bible says. So what are we supposed to do today? We're supposed to follow the scriptures. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. You see, Apostle Paul said, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. So it's not a sin to follow a man if that man is following the Bible. But if a man says, Hey, I just got a new revelation. Come over here and follow me in what I say. And what he's saying is not what the Bible says. Uh-oh. That's a false balance. That's an abomination unto God. That's a man that's saying, follow me and what I say because I just came up with some new doctrine <laughs> and I want you to follow what I say. No thanks. No, you go have your own little, little party and do your own little thing. I'm not following you because you've departed from the Word of God. You're starting a cult and you're starting your own teaching that is not the teaching of the Scriptures. What did I say? First Thessalonians 2.13. Look at what Paul says when he went to Thessalonica. Look at who they, what they accepted. When he went in, he started this church at Thessalonica. Look at what they received. First Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received, when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. We didn't come in here and say, Hi, I'm Paul. Listen to what I have to say and follow me, because I'm Paul and you follow me. I'm Paul. Paul said, I'm sticking with the Scriptures. I'm sticking with the Bible. He says, when I came in, look what you received. You received the Word of God. Why, well, you received the thing that we're supposed to stay on. The line upon line, precept upon precept. Which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I'm going to follow the truth. I'm not going to follow what some man says. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. The only thing we can stand on today is the King James Bible. That's the truth. I'm going to stick with the truth and follow the truth. Last thing I want to say is another S here. I started all these with S. Sometimes it's neat when it does. It probably won't work in Spanish, but we'll see. <laughs> A lot of times in Spanish my, my outlines don't line up, but that's okay. Are you balanced? Are you balanced? This is a question, so let me put a question mark here. Do you preach salvation correctly? Do you preach sanctification correctly? Do you preach the scriptures correctly? Do you preach how to study the Bible correctly? I was giving you mentioned that, and I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> a lot of people, they go to the Bible study, and they, they believe in no dispensations. Other people are what they call hyper-dispensationalists. Both of those are an extreme. We're just supposed to believe that there are dispensations in the Bible. We're not supposed to go to an extreme with it, as some do. I teach dispensations because the Bible teaches dispensations. There's people, that, and they, they say there's no such thing as dispensations, and they're adamant about it. What have they done? They've got their eyes off the Scriptures. The word dispensations used four times in the Bible. There are different ways and different time periods in which God dealt with different people. 
To say otherwise is to be an extremist and then to fall into heresy. To go to an extreme like the hyper-dispensationalist and over-divide, the Bible says rightly divide, not wrongly, is to fall into an extreme and fall into error and mistake. So the last one here I wanted to say is your state. What is your state? By state, I mean daily. How do you live? What is your motive for doing what you do? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We all as Christians, if you are saved, if you are a true Christian, we all live in sinful bodies, unfortunately. And boy, do I hate it. <laughs> so we're supposed to do our best as Christians to get away from sin. So as a Christian, it hurts me when I sin. And I want to please my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so I do my best to stay away from sin. What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians chapter 13? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Why, it's faith that saves. It says, Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. A reprobate is someone who's not really saved. So the Apostle Paul is telling you, if you claim to be a Christian, look and see if you really are saved or not. Alright, so what is it that makes us saved? How are we saved? And he says right there also, he says, if you are saved, then you have Christ in you. Well, if Christ is in you, it's because you believed the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Ephesians 1, 13 tells us that when we've trusted faith in the gospel, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Well, there are people out there that don't understand salvation, but they call themselves Christians. And some people say that you have to do works to get saved. Others say you have to do works to stay saved. That is a heresy. That is a false teaching. According to the Bible, there is eternal security. So once you're saved, you're always safe. How do you know that's true? Because it's called eternal life. <laughs> Eternal life. What does that mean? Life for all eternity. When I got saved, I got the free gift of eternal life. That means I can't lose it. Because if I lose it, it was not eternal. God was a liar. He only gave me something temporal. Eternal means all eternity. When I got saved, I became a son of God. I am always his son through Jesus Christ. I cannot get unborn again. I've been born again. So salvation is eternal. It's eternal security. All right? Some people don't believe that. Some people will go to an extreme, a false balance, which God says is abomination, and they say, well, you can get saved and you can get the Holy Spirit, you can get Christ in you, but when you sin, why, you lose it and he leaves. <laughs> Where's that in the Bible? It's not there. That's their teaching. They say you have to do works to stay saved. All right? The right teaching is we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. It's not works that save us. We're saved by grace. Now, there are other people that will take that and they'll say, Now, grace, why? I'm so saved by grace that I can do whatever I want so I can go sin. So they use grace as an excuse to sin. And I've met people like this. They say, Well, I'm saved by grace, so I'll do whatever I want. I heard a guy say this one time that claimed to be a Christian. And he was a hyper-grace person, I guess. They, they so into grace that they say, that means I can do whatever I want, and I can go sin if I want to. No, no, no. That, you shouldn't. I mean, you can. A Christian can sin, but he shouldn't. But there are people that go to one extreme, and they go to such an extreme. I heard this guy say to me one time, he goes, I'm saved so I can do whatever the hell I want. His words, quote, unquote. He said, I'm saved so I can do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. That doesn't sound like the Christian attitude that we're supposed to have as Christians. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's, that's just horrible. God did not save us to sin. What did God save us to do? To serve. You go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are saved by grace through faith. But the very next verse says, and it's, it's interesting, a lot of people forget this verse, but the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we don't get saved by works, nor do we stay saved by works. Once we're saved, 
We work for Jesus because we love Him. I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to have to go back up here and put it. Because we serve. So I don't do works to get saved. I don't work for Jesus hoping that will keep me saved. Because I am saved, I serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't get the idea, well, now that I'm saved, man, I really like that cute girl that lives next door, so, well, I'm not going to hell, so I might as well go fornicate with her. No, that's, that's a wrong thinking. That's taking an extreme position. What does it do? makes you fall, and you fall into sin, if you think that way. How does the Bible teach that we're supposed to do? Once we're saved, we're so thankful that we're saved for all eternity, that we say, Lord, I just want to serve you. And the mentality in our mind is, you know, I just want to serve you, Jesus. Galatians 5.13 tells us not to use uh, our, our liberty as an occasion for the flesh. God does not want us to go sin because we're saved. We're saved to serve, not saved to sin. So a Christian shouldn't sin. And if he gets an extreme position that, well, I'm so under grace that I can go do whatever I want, that he's going to fall into what? Into sin. And you can't lose your salvation, but that doesn't mean you should go try. <laughs> Amen? Romans chapter 7, verse 6, what does he say? The Apostle Paul says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve, serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. So when we're saved, we should serve. That's why God saved us, is so we could go do something for him. It's not keeping us saved because we do something for Him. It's because we love Him, we serve Him. We're saved by grace through faith. Um, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, rejoicing the Lord, uh, serving the Lord. So serving the Lord. We're supposed to serve the the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 You see, a lot of people that claim to be Christians, they get a false balance. Either they go to one extreme thinking that they've got to do works to stay saved, and that's not right, or they go to the other extreme and say, well, I'm saved, so I'll do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. No, the right slant on that, the balance is, I'm saved by grace through faith, I can't lose it, but you know what? I have a great opportunity to serve Jesus now that I am saved to get rewards in heaven. So I'm going to do everything I can to serve him so I can get those rewards in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the true, uh, the living and true God. So once you're saved, you're saved to serve. You shouldn't be saved to sin. Now, there's a lot of people that do. There's a lot of people that go around and they sin and they do wrong. And they're just as saved as they can be. What are they doing? They're being an abomination to God. They've got a false balance and they're going to fall. And the Bible says you reap what you, you sow. The more you get into sin, the more you can expect to reap in the flesh from that sin. And uh, the Bible says there's a sin unto death. If you get so far into sin as a Christian, God can kill you. And it says, pray not for it. So I don't pray that. I don't ever get on these YouTube videos and go, God, please kill so-and-so. No, 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 no. The Bible says the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. So I would never pray for God to kill somebody. I would pray, God, please be so good to them that they can't stand it so that they'll repent. That's the prayer. That's a biblical prayer. Leviticus 19.36. I'm going to close with these two verses. Leviticus 19.36. Just balances just weights, a just effa, effa, and a just hen shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. God is talking to Israel in the Old Testament, and he's telling Israel, I want you to have a just weight. I want a balance. I don't want you to be an extremist going to one extreme or another. I want you to be where you should be and have a balanced life. Now let's go to Job chapter 31. So I preach this today, and I have a question for you. Looking at you and your Christian life, do you feel that you're balanced? Or have you fallen? Have you fallen into sin? Have you fallen into false doctrine? Have you fallen into heresy? Do you really think you are what you should be? 
You know, when you fall, people see it. People see it. Job 31 6. <clears throat> Job 31 6 says, Let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. Job says, Look, God, weigh me. Put me here, Lord, and see where I end up. Am I way down this way where I shouldn't be into legalism? Or am I way over here? Am I just too liberal? I want to be balanced. I want to have the proper balance as a Christian. God, I don't want to be an abomination in your sight. There's a lot of Christians out there that they're at one extreme or the other, and they've fallen. You've got to make sure your heart's right, and you're doing right, and you haven't fallen. First thing you got to do is make sure you're saved. There are a lot of people out there that only with the mouth said something, but they never believed from the heart. You got to make sure you're sanctified. Have you been saved? If so, then your soul is clean. How about your life? Do you try to live a Christian life? Do you have the right Bible? If not, get rid of what you have and get a King James Bible. Do you study? Do you read the Bible as a Christian daily? I hope so. If so, what is your state? When people look at you, do they say, that is an upstanding, righteous Christian man who's going out of his way to try to live a Christian life. He hasn't gone to an extreme to where he thinks it's okay to sin. He hasn't gone to the other extreme where he's trying to be a Pharisee. <laughs> he's balanced in his Christian life. He's happy. He has joy, peace, righteousness. He's a good Christian man or woman. How about it? Are you balanced? I don't know what else to say. I think I, think I did the best I could to explain that. All too often I see people, they go to an extreme. An extremist is not a good thing. We should do our best to be balanced so that we don't fall one way or the other. How about you? God bless you. See you next week.